Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we're talking about tail draggers. So um, basically I got an email from a young fella and he said, how old should I be to fly tail dragger? And I was kind of surprised by that. So I emailed back and said, it doesn't matter how old you are, why? And he said, well, I've been flying tricycle landing gear and he mentioned a couple of airplanes he's been flying, but in his club, they really recommended him fly for at least two years before he flies a tail dragger. And I thought that sounded like a big, fat, steaming pile of dog crap to me because I know somebody who learned to fly a tail dragger on a real flight simulator and then soloed on a tail dragger. They never flew a tricycle gear. So I don't like people being told that, okay? I mean, I, anybody can learn to fly a tail dragger as far as I'm concerned. Before we get too far into this, if you're new to my channel, I am obsessed with giant scale airplanes. I do have some ARPs. I've got a Cessna 170 by Flex Innovations, which is one of my favorite planes. I have an Avante. I have a little biplane Rockstar. I love all model airplanes, but my obsession is giant scale. I've been flying for over 40 years, and my YouTube channel was created for me to share only with you my experiences. I don't make up stuff. I don't speculate. These are things I've done, and I've been very successful with, so hopefully you can be successful. Um, by hearing what I've done, okay? I want to give a real quick shout out to RTL Fasteners. They're an incredible sponsor of mine. They have all the bolts, nuts, service screws, everything you could possibly want. If you buy more than $50 a product and you use code DA30, you can get 30% off your order. So what is a tail dragger? A tail dragger is well, your main wheels are ahead of your CG and it sets on the tail or the tail wheel or tail skid. Most of us want to get into tail draggers because of warbirds. Some warbirds have a tail wheel, some warbirds have a skid, and the skid is virtually impossible to taxi on the ground with, but I'll talk about that in a minute. What we're going to talk about today, but I'm only going to briefly talk about it for a minute here, is flying a tail dragger is just not the rudder. You have to consider the power. As you add in the power, you have to consider getting the tail in the air and flying. You have to keep your wings level, ailerons, and then you just kind of let her fly. So, what the way, and, I, and I've, I've taught about 101 or 102 people how to fly model airplanes. I'd say 70% of those, we actually got into flying tail draggers together, okay? So, a lot of people, and I'm going to use this C-47 as an example, because if you go to YouTube and you type in C-47 crashes on takeoff, you will see that they actually tell the C-47 pilot to push that yoke all the way forward to get the tail in the air, and then once the tail's in the air, you can take the airplane off. And I'll tell you why. So imagine these little arrows here as the air going over this airplane. Realistically, it looks more like this because the wing's blanking it and the fuselage is blanking a lot of that air. Uh, if, even if it was a single engine airplane, you had a prop blast, it's very turbulent air on that rudder. So to get this plane under control, you need to get the tail in the air. Now, on a model airplane, it's absolutely the same principle, but it's very intimidating to push your stick forward. The reason it is, is a lot of people fly planes that are nose heavy. I did a whole video on why you probably aren't nose heavy and you just, you're, you, you don't need to be nose heavy. If you put the CG right in the right spot in an airplane, it makes it fly so much better, but I'm digressing again. So you got to get your tail in the air. So now let's break this down a little bit more. Um, when you get in a full scale airplane and you fly with somebody uh, who's got their tail dragger endorsement, You'll notice when they take off, they're jabbing that rubber, rudder pedal really fast or what they call happy feet. And the rudder is moving a little bit, but very, very quick because you definitely don't want to let the plane get wonky on you. The moment you let it start to swing around you out of control, you're, you're pretty much done for. You're going to ground loop. So it's really quick little jabs. You want to add your power, not just by going full throttle and changing all the conditions of the airplane, the prop blast, the torque. That's just a bad idea. Number one is you don't have a lot of air over your flying surfaces when you just hammer it, okay? Um, like I just talked about, get the tail in the air. And I'm, and, and I'm going to break that down a little bit more when I talk about my MSL-2 here in a minute. Um, you got to, don't forget to fly the, the wings. If you got a crosswind, you might turn the ailerons into the wind a little bit or make sure you don't get brain lock where you're only using your left thumb, which is your throttle and your rudder if you fly the mode of radio I do. Um, don't forget you got a right hand stick here, okay? You got to push that elevator maybe a little bit forward. Um, and then let her fly. 
So what I want to do is break down for a minute my very first flight uh, with a tail dragger. And this was a long time ago. I had a SIG third scale Cub. And uh, I think it was a SIG. Yeah, I think it was a thig, SIG third scale Cub with like a 124 stroke in it or a 94 stroke. I can't remember how big the four stroke was. But I kind of broke some rules here and I don't want you to do this. I went to the club by myself which you should never do. If you get hurt there, there's nobody to call 911. There's no one to call the ambulance or the Air National Guard or whoever's gonna come save your ass if you get hurt, okay? But I went there because I was embarrassed. I didn't want people to see me learn fly a tail dragger because everybody would tell me what I'm doing wrong. So I got there about six in the morning. The sun had just come up. The dew was still on the ground. I stood directly behind my airplane. And as it started to go and the tail lifted off the ground, it got wonky and I pulled it in the ground put the nose down and flew out and I was lucky. Okay. I mean, I, I just kind of slowly went to full throttle. I came around to land and one of the differences with a tail dragger than a tricycle is when you land a tricycle and the main gear touches the ground, normally your nose drops, which lowers the angle of the attack of the wing. And now your airplane is not flying anymore. Okay. Our natural, muscle memory is on a tail dragger once we touch down we basically let the elevator off so on a tail dragger if the grass is high when you come down and touch your wheels down if you let off the elevator you might nose over like i did and i flipped all the way over it didn't hurt the airplane but it it startled me and then i thought oh i should hold a little bit more elevator when i'm landing so i finally in my mind said okay i need to try to do a three-point landing um, which I try to do with tail draggers or get as close to a three-point landing as I can. I don't do full stall landings because I know people have to go over one of my landings is a full stall landing. That's dangerous. If it works for you, rock on. It doesn't work for me. It's just too much of a chance of wrecking my airplane. But my second takeoff was worse than my first takeoff. My second takeoff, I added the power actually slower. As soon as the tail came off the ground, okay, as soon as the tail came off the ground, the plane really started going everywhere and I finally chopped the power, flipped the plane over, and now I was like super depressed. The next attempt, I really concentrated on keeping the plane straight. I kept my, my I kept up elevator more. The plane got faster and as soon as it started to lift, I let off the elevator a little bit because I didn't want to take off on a stall and then I was off to the races. It wasn't until 30 or 40 flights that I started realizing I don't want to hold up any up elevator once I start my roll. Sure, when you're taxiing, you're holding up up elevator because if there's a lot of grass on your wheels, you don't want to nose over. And most people fly nose heavy airplanes. I don't. But what I found out was as I added power and I let off my elevator, the tail would start to lift. And once my tail was up about here, I was really able to steer it good with the rudder. And then I started realizing, wait a minute, maybe I need to give more down elevator. So I actually learned by about 40 or 50 flights that giving a little bit of down elevator and getting that tail in the air and then I'm off to the races just using the rudder steer is how I finally conquered flying a tail dragger. Um, the landings take just about as long to really master an ace. But now what I want to do is I want to, oh and another thing is on a tricycle landing gear as you're going down the runway a lot of times we will rotate to get it in the air. Okay. On a tail dragger, you're already rotated. So be really careful. I saw this happen on a fly-in where a professionally known ace pilot or builder in the world went down the runway all wonky, yanked it in the air, did a snap roll and destroyed his warbird. And here's a fact, and I know some of you, if you're watching this, won't like this. If you're a really good builder, you've got to learn to fly rudder. There are so many great builders out there that can't fly rudder, and then they go fly a beautiful warbird, and they just screw it up on the ground. They don't even get it in the air, or they snap roll it. But here's one of the things. On some of my tricycle gears, I'll hold almost full up elevator until it rotates, and then I'll let off. On a tail dragger, if you're holding the tail down, and you take off in what's called ground effect, that air, that wing's pretty much stalling. You put any aileron into it, and now you're doing a snap roll, basically. So once you get that tail up in the air, once the plane's ready to fly, it's pretty much got a positive attitude. It's going to take off on its own. That's the reason I say let her fly. Most tail dragger planes will lift into the air on their own, unless you got the nose trimmed down for some reason. Okay. So now what I want to do is talk about 
some of the real, uh, how do I say this? Some of the real world things that I've learned flying a tail dragger. This is my MSL-1, 197 inch wing, 71 pound, 6,000 watt behemoth. It has a tail skid, so I have to guide it where I'm going it. I mean, where I'm leading it to. I've got to grab the wing tip, and with my right hand and my left hand, I've got my radio on my hand, and I'm burping the throttle a little bit to kind of taxi it to where I want to go. If I want to shut the motor down, I'll just pick up the tail of the airplane and, and roll it to where I want to go. But that tail skid, I really can't taxi on the ground. And I know there's people out there that want to go full deflection and f firewall the motor. And I think that's dangerous. Anytime you can't completely steer an airplane, don't be taking a nine horsepower electric motor going to full throttle and hoping you can turn from the pits. Okay. And I actually saw a plane one time with a tail dragger land tore the pits and the guy couldn't turn it. He hit a picnic table. Nobody is on it. Nobody got hurt. But he, because he has a tail skid, this was a Fokker, a big Fokker, he crashed right into the um, picnic table, couldn't control it because he had no rudder, he had no tail wheel, just a skid. This is my MSL-2, and you notice in this video I got full-up elevator. So, like I normally have said, when you taxi around a tail dragger, you got full-up elevator to keep your tail on the ground. I learned the hard way this year, or almost the hard way this year, that that's not always right. I was at a fly-in called Ceph. I was had just landed. It was really super windy. And I had full-up elevator to keep my tail on the ground. And then I got a little bit nervous, like, what if the airplane wants to take off, maybe? So I let off the elevator a little bit because I thought it was so windy that my plane, this plane has such a light wing load. It's 4.5 uh, cube uh, wing load, which is like a trainer or a glider. And But when I turned the airplane around to go downwind, and hang on a minute, let me go back to this real quick and make you, sure you can see it. So I had landed, had full up elevator, afraid the plane was going to take off, so I let off my elevator all the way. So I'm taxiing along, I turned around 180, okay, I had landed down the field. As I started to taxi back, I went to full up elevator to hold the tail on the ground because I knew I didn't have any more wind in the front of me. The actual wind coming behind me caught that elevator up and started to lift my tail. My tail got this high. When I realized what was going to happen, I froze for a second, scared the crap out of me. I let off the elevator, let off the power, and it plopped down hard, didn't hurt the tail wheel. But you've got to always be flying the plane with a tail dragger, okay? I, I don't know how to stress you always are flying the plane. Here is a picture of me taking off. And if you notice, my ailerons, my rudder, my elevator, everything's all over the place on this takeoff. I had a crosswind. But the thing is, is with a tail dragger, that jabbing I've told you about, or the happy feet if you were in a real airplane, that jabbing is what keeps you under control, no matter if you're taking off or landing. And now I'm going to talk about the landing part. There is a part of flying that we feel relaxed, and that's normal. The moment, normally the moment we've landed, okay? So I don't know how to stress how important it is until your airplane's back in the pits, you're technically still under control of it. I've, this has happened to me once, and it's, I've seen it happen a lot to people who fly tail draggers. You are so laser focused on the takeoff, and you go right down the runway, and you get in the air, and you're all excited, and you're like, man, I aced that, I kept it right down the line. You fly around and do all your happy, crazy crap. Then you come into land and you, you are just going to grease it in. You touch down and you're like, wow, awesome. And then two seconds later, the plane starts to fishtail. It starts to wiggle. Then you ground loop it and you're like, oh, man. There's a part of us, the moment we touch down, we're like, okay, we're on the ground. We can go get that chili hot dog covered with extra cheese and onion and get a big old A&W root beer. And yay, we're on the ground. Not with a tail dragger. Until you have gotten it back in the pits, you're always running or controlling the rudder, okay? Here's another thing I would suggest you learn, learn how to do. This looks like just a basic flyby. Actually, this is part of a takeoff. You've got to learn to go way down the runway and take off coming back toward the center of the runway. Because if you get really good on a tail dragger that you can take off the entire length of the runway and anywhere on the runway, then you're starting to get the skills that you can really say you're mastering a tail dragger. There's something about jabbing that rudder back and forth really quick when you're flying kind of toward your, well, not toward the pits, but toward show center or the center of the runway that you, um, 
that it's easy to get your orientation screwed up. That you, you're you doing it so fast that for a moment you have a brain fart and you start to turn it the wrong way and then you overcompensate and you have sometimes you want to you're, yank the plane off and you're actually coming toward the pits. I've never done that where I'm coming toward the pits. I normally will chop my power and even if I do a ground loop, I do a ground loop. But I've seen people doing that and they take off right for the pits and I know one time they flew right over the pits out over all the cars came back around and of course they got talked to here's another example believe it or not this is planes already taken off flying toward us a friend of mine had a drone over the middle of the runway he's sitting to my left his name's Eamon he's a really kick-ass guy and if you've seen any of the drone to air, air to drone videos of mine he's the guy who flies the drones uh, normally, once in a while, my friend Berger and Dean fly their drone, but this guy is like the best in the world as far as I'm concerned. But I've already taken this airplane off and I'm flying it toward us to do a fly by a drone. But it was way down there. And it's really weird sometimes when you're taking off toward yourself with a tail dragger, how much you are moving that rudder to keep it straight. Okay. This is uh, the only picture I know of of my maiden flight of my MSL 2. And the reason I'm showing this to you is that we used to call this the big banana, yet the big, big yellow banana. And the very first year I flew it, I had no paint on it, no pinstriping, no wheel pants, no skirts. The reason I did this is I had designed a funky wing and kind of a funky, some funky things on this airplane. I didn't know how it was going to fly. If it wasn't going to fly great, I might have shelved it for a year or two. But the plane flew flew way beyond my greatest expectations. But once I started flying it and I really knew I mastered it, then I finished it. The reason I would just suggest to people to consider doing this is sometimes finishing the airplane, we add another pound or two to the airplane. Sometimes finishing the airplane, we fall so deeply in love with those 25,000 rivets we did or making that scale cockpit look so beautiful that when we go to test fly, we get scared of that test flight. And honestly, test flights with tail draggers can be really hairy. On a tricycle landing gear airplane, like I said before, when you land, as soon as the wheels touch down, that angle of attack drops, you're on the ground. I had a half scale pits one time, and I always fly all my planes with a CG just a little bit aft. But I had a little bit of geometry problem. I'm not going to go into this too much because I've already done a video called Taming a Tail Dragger and Taming a Tail Dragger Part 2. And it talks about your setup of a tail dragger. These created huge controversies, but my planes fly perfect. They're awesome, so I must be doing something right. But as soon as I would touch this plane down, it would always just start to go completely wonky on me. And it took 20 flights on that half scale pits for me to figure out what was going on. Why would it take off so perfect? But why would it land so bad? And I'll tell you why. But I'm not going to get into the geometry because I've already done a video on this. And I don't want anybody on this video just making up crap to stir up drama. When I take off, I always go full down elevator to get the tail in the air. Or pretty close to full down elevator. If you've ever seen me fly my planes, you're like, holy cow, that elevator is all the way. Sometimes I'll drag the elevator in the grass until the tail gets in the air. Because when I go full down elevator, it's almost touching the ground. So imagine if you can, the airplane rolling like this, and then I get the tail in the air and I take off. And once I've left the ground, my speed is increasing. Now I'm coming into land and I touch down and I'm going pretty fast because I'm landing. And then as I start to lay the tail down, I'm still going really, really fast. And the geometry and the wheels didn't like that. And they started making my plane go crazy. And it took everything in my rudder to keep it straight to the point I almost ground looped it two or three times. Once I got the geometry right, the airplane was absolutely perfect to fly. And I think I had 300 flights on that airplane before I sold it. But look, everybody, I'm trying to keep this super simplistic and simple. Anybody can fly a tail dragger. It just takes stick time. Anybody can fly a tail dragger. It takes some basic concepts of understanding that when we fly model airplanes, we normally like to be really smooth on the sticks unless we're a 3D pilot or a yank and bank. But on that rudder, don't be afraid to move it because it's going to take quick inputs. It doesn't take big inputs. It takes quick inputs to really keep that plane straight. The last thing I want to leave you with here is 
I got my club along 30 years ago really mad at me because I went out with white flat spray paint and spray painted lines on the grass because I wanted to practice taking off exactly straight with my tail draggers. Everybody got mad. Um, I said, look, after you cut it three times, the paint's gone. What's the problem? And three times later, the, the paint was gone. So I'm not telling you to go out and paint your field. You could use crepe paper and um, some like toothpicks or something to hold it straight and tight to the grass. But if you teach yourself in a crosswind, um, in a quartering wind, headwind, to take off straight every time with a tail dragger, have one of your friends videotape it. Because when you watch how much you're moving that rudder, you'll really start to feel a, a level of self-accomplishment self that you've really mastered flying a tail dragger. Okay? Um, and then the very last thing is, not all tail draggers are the like. Okay? When I fly most warbirds that have a decent wing load and are built straight, they're a pleasure to fly. The GBs, I've flown two different ones. They should never be your first tail dragger because a GB has to land almost full stall landing or as slow as you can get it. I hate full stall landings. That's the reason I hate flying GBs. Um, if you do land hot, try to get your tail up and keep that tail in the air until it quits flying and then it plops down. If you touch down hardly with any speed of the GB, it, it, as soon as it hits and the tail comes down, your angle of attack goes up and you get into a pilot-induced oscillation and you can beat the crap out of the airplane. Um, also, that rudder inputs, because this, this rudder basically does not have a lot of effectiveness once this nose gets into the air. If you want to, if you don't believe me, take any model airplane, get it up there and slow fly it really, really slow. Don't move your ailerons, because the moment you move your ailerons, you know it's causing drag, adverse yaw, or it's changing the angle of attack and you can stall a wing. Get a really, really high angle of attack, even if you've got to add a little bit of power. And then measure how much rudder it takes to kind of turn the airplane around, keeping the wings level, of course. Then do that just flying normally, move that rudder and watch how much it yaws. So the greater the angle of attack, the less wind that's going over the rudder. On a GB, it's almost none. But um, that's it, everybody. I hope you find this informative. I don't care if you're six years old or 60 years old, you can learn to fly tail dragger. Okay, now I would go to the field when not a lot of people are around and if you can get out and stand behind it the first couple of times. Okay, um, but only do that two or three times. Don't do it every time or you'll get, you'll, you'll train yourself some really bad habits. But maybe the first time just to feel excited you got in the air, you might stand behind the plane, have a spotter with you, make sure no one else is going to hit you with their airplane, get the plane into the air and then you back off the runway. Okay. Um, now, if you want to taxi a whole lot and really get comfortable with the plane and then turn the plane away from you, if you've got a wide enough airfield and then take off flying away from you, you can do that too. But I want everyone to ultimately know how to fly a tail dragger because they are just so much fun and they teach you how to use the freaking rudder. Okay? So as usual, I always end these videos with saying, take a kid flying. We got to keep the youth in, in aviation, get them away from the video games where they go in and slaughter everybody, you know, in, in the city. Get away from video games and get them into aviation. There's physics, science, geometry, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and our hobby is going to die because there's a lot of old farts that hate FPV, hate drones, hate quads. And that's a part of our hobby now. Just like they hated gliders back in the day and hated helicopters. They're now hating the quads and the FPV. We got to love everybody, folks. Okay, so rock on. Have a great day. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Be safe.